Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Michael Curtis and William Keeley's The Adventures of Robin Hood. Uh, this is the 1938 film starring, um, sorry, Errol Flynn and Olivia de Havilland. Um, and it's one of the most iconic Robin Hood films of all time. It's also a really fascinating document in terms of both the reception of medieval culture and its depiction on film, but also in terms of the particular time period that this film was created, which is 1938. So one of the reasons that I love this film is because all of the characters are very brightly dressed. And that's actually really authentic based on um, what we know about medieval material culture, um, particularly for knights, but even for peasants. This sort of very contemporary idea that we see in, in contemporary medieval movies and TV where everyone is in black or just drab grays and things like this is really not very accurate, particularly for knights. Um, knights and aristocrats wore very bright colors, in part because this signified wealth, because dyes were quite expensive. Some dyes more expensive than others. Um, blue dyes, actually in England, were relatively affordable. And so a lot of peasants, particularly women, wore blue clothing. But dyes in general were very expensive. And so the more color you had in your outfit, the more wealth you possessed. But also because heraldry was a crucial component of knightly identity. And, I mean, one of the things with this is, like, in this film... People are just, like, going around in armor all the time, which was not at all the case. Um, people did not just go around wearing chain mail and stuff uh, all, all, the, all the time when they were just hanging out in castles and feasting and stuff like this. But heraldry was a, comp a crucial component of knightly identity because you wore a helmet with a full face covering if you were a knight. And so you could not see who you were fighting you had to identify them by their coat of arms, which would be emblazoned on their tunic, it would be emblazoned probably on a shield, things like this, so that you could actually identify them, people. And coats of arms are very brightly colored. So I love that. It, they, they, this is pre the sort of mid-90s turn to a grittier aesthetic. Um, this is not sort of like, you think of like, um, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, is around the time we start getting this shift to this very modern sort of gritty aesthetic. But you think about things like Game of Thrones, uh, Vikings, um, shit, what's the name of it? Um, the series with Uhtred of Bebenbear. I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head, but you have these sort of properties where everybody is just in sort of plain browns or blacks or gray clothing, and that really wasn't what life was like. Um, so I like that. I like that very colorful depiction, really embracing the medieval love of color. That being said, it's also a really interesting film because of the way that its politics play out. So one of the things that always fascinates me with Robin Hood stories, um, Robin Hood movies and TV shows, is this idea that Richard the Lionheart was genuinely an English king. I mean, not, he was legally. I mean, he was a he was a mar monarch of England. Yes, he was born in England, and he he spent the first few years of his life there. But he was basically French. That's the reality of it. Um, Richard probably did not speak English, uh, even even early uh, 
Old English, Middle English, Richard almost certainly did not speak. He probably spoke French and Occitan, possibly some Latin. He did not speak English, though. He was not English in the sense we think of the English today. Um, he was a Norman. And there was no question that he was a Norman. Um, which is one of the reasons it's so fascinating that this movie chooses to make the conflict not between the rich and the poor, but between the Normans and the Saxons. And yet, Richard is supposed to be the great defender of the Saxons, who are equated basically with the, the poor, the downtrodden, the suffering, whereas the uh, Normans are identified with the nobility, the wealthy, the extravagant, the oppressors, the taxers, etc., etc. And to a certain extent, that's true. I mean, in 1066, the Normans conquered England. Um, 1066 and then the subsequent years, the Normans conquered Saxon, uh, Anglo-Saxon England. They established themselves as an elite minority with the power to tax, with the power... Uh, to build castles, to raise armies, etc., etc. So that's not necessarily wrong. But the idea that Richard the Lionheart, a Norman, who was raised in France, spent much of his reign either in France or on campaign, he probably spent less than a year of his adult life in England. The idea that he was somehow on the side of the Saxons, that he was somehow an English king who properly cared about the English people, it's, I mean, it's, it's a romantic fantasy. There, it's really not, it's really not borne out by the way that um, 11th century and 12th century England, or 12th into 13th century with the reign of King John, is really not borne out by the way that 12th century England actually functioned. Why do it? Well, I actually think this is a, this is a very, very important element in terms of uh, this film coming out in 1938. So first off, we are not that far off in 1938 from the Red Scare of the 20s, the first major Red Scare uh, in, in response to the emergence of the Soviet Union. And 1938, the U.S. and the world really is still in the grip of the Great Depression. There is substantial unemployment, people are impoverished, um, People continue to blame the, uh, the wealthy, the stock market, stock investors, people like this, for the suffering of the country, quite, quite justly, uh, in fact. And so, in, so it makes a lot of sense that Warner Brothers is not going to put out a film in the 30s that says, rob from the rich and give to the poor, right? Because what that suggests is class antagonism, that the poor have a legitimate grievance against the rich and that the forced redistribution of property <laughs> might actually be a way of rectifying those grievances. If you are a Warner Brothers executive, in the 30s, chances are you're reasonably wealthy, not on the side of the poor or the working class, and you are probably terrified of having your property forcibly redistributed the way that it, uh, the way that it was to a certain extent in the Soviet Union. This is therefore the the setting this up as the conflict between the. Um, Anglo, the, the Saxons on one side and the Normans on the other is therefore a way of making this a kind of ethnic conflict as opposed to a class conflict. 
hey, poor movie-going Americans, don't get any ideas about overthrowing the rich, because that's not what Robin Hood is about. It's a very interesting shift. And I think what we get in addition to this, that, that sort of further complicates this shift in the shift away from Robin Hood as sort of folk hero who redistributes wealth to upstanding patriot is that Robin is utterly dedicated in his own way to Richard the Lionheart. And so, by extension, the Merry Men are dedicated to Richard the Lionheart. They are presented as the people who are genuinely loyal to the king. And, importantly enough, what the king represents, which in this film is lawful, moral, and good authority. By contrast... People like Prince John, like uh, Guy of Gisborne, like the um, the Abbot of the Black Covenant, Bishop of the Black Canons, um, the Sheriff of Nottingham. These people represent illegitimate authority. They represent the attempt to pervert the legal, lawful, moral authority of good King Richard for their own personal gain. This is really important in the context of Red Scare and the Great Depression. The problem is not the system. The problem is that a few people abuse the system. And what this essentially translates into in the cultural politics of the 1930s is don't question capitalism. Capitalism is a lawful, good, moral authority represented or stood in for, in this case, by Richard the Lionheart. Some bad actors within the capitalist system have perverted it, and that's why we're in the Great Depression. It's not the system's fault. You, the average, hard-working, or unemployed, uh, you, the average person watching this movie in 1938, should not be questioning capitalism, because capitalism is good and righteous. And you should, in fact, be standing up for capitalism. Because that's what makes you a proper hero. That's what it means to be a proper, uh, a proper American in this case. Um, this is a really, really interesting shift, and and making this an ethnic conflict between the Saxons and the Normans allows them to obfuscate the ways in which. The Robin Hood story is a almost communistic story, right? Because the ethos of robbing from the rich to give to the poor is not simply a question of some of the rich abuse their power unjustly. It is fundamentally an anti-feudalistic, but also anti-capitalist stance, even though capitalism did not exist during the reign of Richard the, uh, Richard the Lionheart. It simply wasn't a thing. But the idea that you might question and challenge social conventions that are built on hierarchies and dispossession, oppression, the suffering of the mass uh, the vast majority of people within a society, that's really central to the Robin Hood narrative. And strangely enough, by having Richard be the sort of ultimate hero, the guarantor of social stability at the 
at the end of the film especially, but as the sort of figure who stands for the guarantor of social stability throughout the film, it undermines that potentially revolutionary message. The message, again, becomes not challenge the system because the system itself has created your suffering and dispossession, but rather stand up for the proper system and challenge the small number of people who pervert it. This especially struck me at the very end of the film, when Richard is sort of properly restored to his throne, and he makes this proclamation that he's going to banish injustice throughout his land. How? This is a feudal system. Even if John and the Bishop of the Black Cannons, um, the High Sheriff of Nottingham, even if these people are expelled, even if they are in exile, this is still a feudal monarchical system. It is built on systemic inequalities. Richard will continue to tax his people. He will continue to fight wars that primarily benefit the nobility. He will continue to punish people for hunting the king's deer. He will continue to do all of the stuff that a medieval monarch does. All of the things that that fundamentally structure this society are, are things that are oppressive to the Saxons, to the peasants, to the working class. You can't get away from it within feudal society. And equally importantly, you can't get away from it within capitalist society. The very nature of capitalism is rooted on the exploitation of the labor of the working classes, the poor, even the middle classes, primarily for the enrichment of the capitalist class. You can't get away from that. It's simply the nature of the social structure. And this film, again, it's a fascinating shift by making this a conflict between ethnic groups and then somehow ignoring the fact that Richard is the leader of the, the villains, the villainous ethnic group, this film undercuts any potential critique of the existing social order. Do not look behind the curtain. Do not question capitalism in the 1930s during the Depression because capitalism is on the side of King Richard.